everyone. Welcome to Maud's Book Club. Uh, we love interviewing and chatting with the authors that we cover every single month. And uh, this is a fun book. I first bought this and it was in my TBR for a while. Sorry. Mm. No. Mm. For, a while. <laughs> for a while. Heard great things about the book. Uh, it turns out the series is ongoing and the next one comes out in May. So I thought what a great time for an entire book club community that loves sci-fi and fantasy to start this series or revisit it if you were a fan earlier and hopefully smash out all oh, the emotes are coming for me uh smash out the entire series by the time we get to the final well no seven, second final? we'll ask we'll talk about it uh book six lightbringer available may pre-orders i think are out at the moment so if you want to pre-order it absolutely get your fingers all over that one and Tap, tap, and click, click. Um, the author of Red Rising, the book that we covered, which was, we got a lot of five stars for this one. A lot of people absolutely loving this book. Some of us really, really gutted that we have to wait another month in between to continue the series. Some of us needing a bit of a break, that is fine. Uh, Pierce Brown is the author. He is apparently, according to Wikipedia, just a science fiction writer, which I'm going to talk more about. I don't think that you just do science fiction. Uh, he wrote the Red and is continuing to write the Red Rising series. Uh, already the books that have come out, Red Rising, Golden Sun, Morning Star, Iron Gold, Dark Age. This is a phenomenal series, which I can't wait to talk about. Give it up for Pierce Brown, everyone. Woo! Am I, allowed to, am I allowed to talk Emojis. now or am I still silence mode? No, you can talk to me now. I can talk now? I did your intro. You did. It was a great intro. Yeah. You uh, left Sorry, out uh, the most important New York most Times best, sell, best selling author. There we go. There we go. That's how you should introduce me all the time. New I have York a friend Times. that does that and it's exhausting. Sorry. Uh, yeah, but you, you left out the most important uh, figure in my life, which is Eo, my puppy, who I was gonna you know, say, has an affection for you. Yeah. Dog dad of the yeah. century. Dog dad, yeah. How it's is in my bio in the back of the book now, actually. How is Eo? I want to scoot you that way. How is she? She's good. My mom's visiting, so uh, she's entertaining her out in the living room. Oh, really? I'm huddled in here with you guys, yeah. I wanted Eo in here. Where's Zelda? No, she's had enough of our shit already. That's in true Zelda <laughs> style. We love it. We love it. Uh, so some of the first questions I want to talk about with this book, it's going to be really, really difficult. And for those that have written, uh, read more of the book, no spoilers. We're literally just talking about this first book, Red Rising, here. I feel like I'm about a, like a good decade behind the conversation with you for this one. You wrote it a long time ago. You were 23. I did. You were 23 when you wrote this. 20. I was 22 when I wrote it. Oh. Uh, or 23. I guess it's, uh, I guess I started writing it when I was 22, finished it when I was 23. Yeah. And it came out, uh, it came out in 2014. Sure. But we, I can still abide the no spoilers policy. It still plagues the fandom on various discords and on Reddit. Uh, so people spoilers? are pretty respectful. Spoilers, yeah, because uh, some people find the book later on. But books, like Wizards, you know, arrive exactly when they mean to. Uh, nicely said. Um, Thank you. How did this all come about? How did you become a writer? Well, I didn't know it was possible to become a writer because my parents, yeah, I didn't grow up in an uh, artist-driven household, but uh, I moved around a lot when I was a kid. And uh, I think I was on my eighth state by the time I was 18. Mm. And you can't take friends with you, obviously. Uh, they have their own lives. But you can take books with you. And so my books were my friends and the people between the pages. And the pages were the people that, uh, I guess, like taught me a lot of things. And so, you know, I'd, I'd always be outside when I was a kid. And so I'd be like, you know, digging holes or building a fort. And I would uh, continue the stories long after they'd finished. So, you know, in Star Wars, I, I found a lot of love, or a lot of, how to say, it, adventures and a lot of love in the uh, expanded universe. You read every single book I heard. Every single Pretty book. Pretty much every, sing every book until the New Jedi Order, yeah. So I don't know if that's like some 200 all told or something. But uh, I just really loved that series. And so I was able to, sometimes I was able to, you know, continue it with, um, in, like in Star Wars' case, with the books that came out. But other times, you know, I'd have to extrapolate. And I guess I was building the, 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 the storyteller muscles when I was young. My parents would tell you that I would, like, you know, talk faster and then just tell stories and then fall asleep. <laughs> they, could always, they could always tell when I was uh, tired because I'd just be bullshitting and then uh, fall it's asleep mid-sentence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exhausting. I, you know, I wouldn't say I was an easy kid to raise, but my parents got me hooked on uh, uh, all the great classics in Western literature abridged. So they're written for, like, uh, eight, nine-year-old kids. 
And so they were giving me, you know, the Three Musketeers, Great Expectations and stuff when I was really young, and we had the whole set. There was hundreds of books that I had access to, and there was no barrier of entry. You know, I was able to understand the themes and the characters of Dickens's books or of Alexander Dumas's or Mary Shelley's Frankenstein without having to have the reading level. So I think that it was very much ingrained in me at a young age to tell stories, but I didn't start until I was 18. And uh, I was waiting for the new Game of Thrones actually to come out at the time because I read Game of Thrones in high school and yep. was made fun of mercilessly. Really? I got my whole family into Game of Thrones as oh, soon as see, I found out no, it was a series going to be no, made like into no one. In my, no one in my family would read it. Um, so it was my own private thing. You know, none of my friends really read it. Oh, um, and I got I got taunted. Uh, I still remember like in math class, a kid like, you know, taking up my book and reading the back and like, oh, Daenerys and her full grown dragons. And I'm like, you don't even know. I actually had that with Harry Potter when I was in year eight. Uh, wait. Yeah, I, same. I've got same. to stop doing that because I wasn't alive. <laughs> when, when you're eight? Yeah, when, I wasn't alive when the books came out, obviously. Uh, my bad. Oh, no, but, no, no. Yeah. It's your, you're celebrating your 27th birthday, I think, right? Soon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just had it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but with the Harry Potter books, I remember trying, like, I smashed it out. I was, like, under the bre the bed sheets with the torch. <laughs> mm -hmm. we didn't have oh, anything. my gosh. So, so often, yeah, yeah. And I would fall asleep in school because I, I would never be able to go to bed. I failed Japanese because oh, I was reading God. this damn book. And I remember going to all my friends, you have to read it, you have to read it. And they're like, what is it about? And I'm like, it's a boy wizard. And they're like, no one's going to, no one's going to like this book. No one cares, Maud. And that was like. No one cares, Maud. And now you have no friends, Maud. Okay, back to the books. Oh, too, too, too close. I have some so, friends. You do? No, no. I was being the bully. I was taking on the voice of the character. Oh. Yeah. No, you have friends. You have a lot of friends. <laughs> you have so many friends. You have too many friends. There's one. <laughs> I hope. Um, okay. So you read, read, you read a lot of books, but. Read a lot of books. Yeah. And so I was waiting for, uh, what was it? It was Between Feast of Crows and Dance of Dragons. Mm. And so, um, my parents moved yet again, and I'd yet to start uh, start college, and I was you know home during the summer, and uh, I just started writing a book, and I wrote a book uh, that was you know terribly bloated and awful and a fantasy book. What was about, it about? Oh my God, I can't even tell you. Uh, yes, you can. No, I can't. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it was like oh, it was so pretentious. It was called a a requiem for light, and it was about this. That's cool. Uh, yeah, it's about these uh, super beings in this fantasy, like high fantasy world that uh, used to patrol the skies on Pegasuses and Griffins, and they would have like aerial jousting fights, like throwing lances at each other and superior. And then um, slowly they'd turned into an oppressive, um, you know, superhuman regime. So some of these things got oh, up, ended okay. up in Red Rising. Okay, what yeah, is it about but... that theme that you love so much? Um, I think that humanity has always been a pyramid, um, and in any society, whether it is uh, communism, um, you know, socialism, uh, fascism, uh, democracy, it ends up being a pyramid-shaped structure with an oligarchy at the top. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in fundamental human truths, you know, and I think that investigating that through science fiction and fantasy is um, quite fun because... We can look at our own world and see reflections of it in a dark mirror, so to speak. Do you think we're and, all fucked? Well, I think that every generation throughout time has claimed to saying that. Uh huh. So yes and no. Okay. Oh. Yeah. My swear count is going up. We're we're a relatively young. We're yeah we're a relatively young species. Uh, so you know, don't know how much longer we have left, but we could be fucked. We're certainly fucked in the end, you know. The sun will die out, but yeah. You know. mm, fun. Then we're talking billions of years instead of thousands. So in the end, we're fucked. But yeah. No, I think the worst thing is going to happen before the sun blows up. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. we'll find a way. Are you going to move to Mars if that's an option? No, I hope to attain a level of fame that my ashes are scattered there. But I would that's not move nice. there. I'd visit there. Yeah, I think that's the only reason I would actually like fame. Is just that, that that NASA would be like, well, we have to take him up. You got to be buddies with Elon. He's running the whole Mars regime, isn't he? Well, you know what I said about oligarchs. So, <laughs> buddies with Elon. I, um, when did you learn to write? Did you do well, uh, well in school for writing? No, no, school didn't really hold my interest. So it was always very difficult. I, I don't think often I even got into AP English. Uh, What's that? History Sorry. was always. Yeah, what's, history is my passion. What's AP English? For the Advanced time? Placement English. So it's oh. like the, the place where they send the smart kids, you know, in school. Oh. So I went to public schools. I went to private schools. I went to very, like 12 schools overall. 
So I was. Do also, they have that for yeah. all subjects in America? Do they literally like? It depends on the school system, oh. um, and depends. Yeah, depends on the school system. But uh, so I wouldn't say I was especially. I wouldn't say I received any compliments for my writing at a young age, huh. except when I uh, we had like in sixth grade. A, actually, I remember this kind of fondly. We had in seventh grade a uh, assignment to write a poem, and I wrote. I was reading Milton at the time, as one does, and I wrote this in, incredibly epic poem. Uh, epic in terms of like it wasn't like great, but it was very epic size wise. Right. And uh, I turned in my professor, and he thought I had uh, plagiarized it. So that was the first compliment I got on my oh, writing. Oh, that's just... wonderful. Do you still have yeah. that poem? Oh, it's somewhere around here. It's probably on my old Sony Vio or something. Yeah, it was a poem about war written by uh, a 13 year old. It's that theme again. Yeah, yeah. And was, I, I don't, these, these are things I love. My first, uh, I think my first like, coloring book was like of the Trojan War. Um, so I've always been obsessed with the, the Greeks and the Romans for very different reasons. Who's your favorite uh, Greek slash Roman god? Oh, god? Yeah. Um, Athena. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Athena. Um, I've always enjoyed her as, uh, well, she's one of the lasting totems of uh, the strong feminine in, in Western canon. In fact, in many ways, she was the first strong female character, um, which is, you know, how Red Rising was born from another strong female character that lasted the test of time uh the play antigone that was 2500 year old play and it's a story about a woman who wasn't allowed to bury her brother mm -hmm. and she buried him anyway and uh was told she'd be executed if she buried him and because he was a rebel and she buried him and uh we're still taught i mean people still read that people still perform that play and i've always thought that to be very powerful um it's Sorry, I'm probably jumping ahead to your question. Antigone's questions. disobedience of Creon's rules when she insists on burying her brother. Mm -hmm. uh, Antigone, Haman, and Eur Eur Eurydice? Yeah, sure. <laughs> How do you say it? Eurydice, but like there's, Eurydice. you know, Yeah, you can say it so many different ways. They all die at the end of the play. It's like saying Achilles. You can say Achilles, Achilles, Achilles. It's all transliteration. Who said anyway. Achilles? I, there's various uh, people who are far smarter uh, than I am and actually read Greek who debate the topic. So really? People, I mean, it's Achilles is probably more accepted in terms of actual pronunciation, but I don't speak Greek. I wish I did. Yeah. Um, but it seems I just don't even have time for my existing hobbies. I so. can see. I can see it being Achilles, where it's like yeah, yeah announcing themselves. Yeah. 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 Well, um, it would work with the, the hard K they, they like and are so fond of. Mm. <laughs> Why, B -Rock, no, I just saw a comment. B Rock Vandal says Achilles, baby back ribs. I don't understand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's that? I don't know. I just need barbecue sauce. Um, we have actually got a bunch of people. Thank you to Keegan Skookin, who subscribed using their Prime. Very Prime of you. Sol Pyro's just followed. Gaia Darling's resubscribed for 24 months. A big hello to you. Brittany has followed and also, oh, love Alexa. Love Alexa. Hey, is Alexa. Is here. Lovely to have you here as well. Um, a couple of comments that are happening here. We've got Tuffy, nope. Tough Annie Ann has says, Pierce has taken over as my favorite author. Yeah. Um. Oh, everyone's trying to educate me on advanced placement. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I went to... Yeah, school systems. Uh, oh, a couple of... Uh, Slater CM wants to know if you've read a couple of books. Have you read the Stormlight Archive? I've read the first one. I've read the first chapter of the first one. Um, and then wanted to also... I read it earlier. wanted to know if you've read uh, the Song of Achilles to bring uh, us back yeah. on topic. Uh, Madeline Engel, I think, right? It? Madeline uh, Miller. Madeline Miller, that's right. Um, I yeah. wept like a baby after that. I did book. really like it. I mean, my you favorite. You did read my, it. I liked it. Yeah, no, I liked it a lot. She's very talented. Oh. I'd say my my favorite book, or you know, not book but poem, is is the Iliad. So uh, oh, okay. You really no, do I like just, your Greek I, Greek and Roman history, huh? You no, know, I, I like legitimately love it. Um, yeah, and so I try to read the primary sources. That's why I would love to learn Greek so I could actually read it in, you know, without a translator, um, be my own translator. Mm. But uh, yeah, so anyone who plays in that field, particularly as well as Madeline did, I, I, I oh, really beautiful. enjoy that. And, and often people play in that, you know, play with the Iliad and don't do a very good job. So Song of Achilles, I think, is a tremendous book. I think Achilles' story is really interesting. We're looking at it through Hollywood's lens with um, Brad Pitt playing Achilles. And uh, 
all of a sudden you you would enjoy that. Yeah. Well, I mean that was quite nice. Oh, um, not gonna lie, I bought a gym membership afterwards. <laughs> did you? Did you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's quite Im- impressive. I'm. There's a couple of Aussies in the movie, so that's why I liked it. Uh, mm-hmm. But I did notice that instead of um, having a lover, uh, it was his cousin, played by Garrett Hedlund in the film. And then, of course, I liked that Madeline Miller was like, no, no, Hollywood. Um, Achilles, the most masculine, strong man ever, was very much interested in men and this man in particular. So I'm going to share their love story together. So Because it was erased in Hollywood. It was erased. Well... You know, there's there's some interpretation. Uh, some of that's left up to interpretation. That's smooch. not like the, that's yeah, yeah, sure. But that's not like the cold hard fact saying he's like interested in men. He, you know, he was Greek, so he's probably interested in both because he did, you know, basically quit the war for Briseis. That was, of course, his pride too. But <laughs> semantics, right? Uh, it was a a sign in the Greek times. Then uh, the sign of status and wealth was to have a young mm-hmm. boy as a plaything. Well, to a degree, uh, uh-huh. it would depend on what city state you're in. In Athens, <laughs> particularly, yes. Yeah. In uh-huh. Sparta, Sparta, they treated that much more seriously. It was more so you would take on a young man as your student, oh. and Mental. that off that sometime would be sexual, but often was not sexual. Um, but with the Athenians, they were made fun of by the Spartans for being, you know, so fascinated with young boys. Right. So the, the, even within the Greek city states, there was different interpretations of that. Okay, so uh, is this? Did you study this through school, mm-hmm. through college, no. or is this a hobby? Hobby. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, hobby. So that's probably why Red Rising it reads not as much like sci-fi, more like science fiction or science fantasy. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I look at it as uh, I look at most of my influences. Sure, they're sci-fi influences, but I'd say. So much of the influence that comes from history, as opposed to other things in the science fiction realm. Like um, of course, there's Dune. a bit of dystopian. Yeah, it's like there's Dune in there. There's Game. Ender's Game, Battle Royale, Hunger Games. But it's all this common well. There's, I, for me, it doesn't feel like, uh, how would I say it? Hunger Games as much as it feels like Lord of the Flies. Yeah. Lord of the Flies was one of the formative books when I was younger. Battle Royale was one of the first books I'd read uh, that was uh, non-American. Mm. Um, and so it's kind of like, uh, how would I say it? It's at an intersection where it has some things in common with uh, properties that exist. But then as the Golden Sun and in Morning Star, you'll see the historical influence come further and further into the limelight. So um, usually with a first book, like... Mm. I was I was hearing that you re, you read it you write it from the heart instead of the mind because this is like a passion project is your first book. Um, mm-hmm. Is there that's anything, accurate? Yeah. Is there anything in this book that so many years later you're like oh, I would have just tweaked or oh, well, this could have been good. Red Rising was my seventh book uh, that I wrote. Six before that I wrote uh, did what not were get they published. About? A lot of things. Science. There was science fiction. There was historical fiction. There was fantasy. There was a thriller. I uh, wrote a bunch of different things and I had to, what do I say? How do I say it? I feel as though uh, you have to exercise the mimicry um, because what all you're doing is you're a fan, you have taste, and then you start realizing that you have your own voice. So, you know, Red Rising, while it was my first published book, um, was at that strange intersection of discovering my voice and also uh, it being a heart passion project. Um, because I remember I didn't even outline it. I just sat down and started writing. That's called pantsing. Um, I'm a pantser. Yeah, um, so I fully. only just discovered this term today because yeah. I'm not a writer. I'm a reader and I'm oh, a talker. It g- yeah, you yeah, it pan- gives everyone. An- Go ahead. Well, pantsing, from what I thought it was, you deck, you deck someone, you pull the pants down. Well, you can do that too. It's oh. not you know mutually exclusive term. I you know I've I've done that in my day. Yeah. Mm. You pants them and you cherry tree them. What's the cherry tree part? Uh, you have someone kneeling behind them and then they get pushed over. That would happen to me. I was the new kid at school a lot. So I got oh, I was going to say, I thought you yeah. were doing it to other people. Oh, no, no. I wasn't a bully. I was always new. Oh, that's tough. Yeah. Did yeah, that shape yeah. your personality completely? Yeah. It taught me to have a lower center of gravity so you can't get pushed over. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, you haven't uh, explained cherry tree. David, General David Petraeus, uh, who helmed the efforts in Iraq for a long time, had something that he told uh, incoming officers. And he says, be polite and courteous, but always have a plan to kill everyone you meet. So my plan in high school was to, you know, uh, have a plan to not get cherry treed wherever I went. So whenever someone came up to me, I'd always be suspicious that I was about to get pants or cherry treed. 
we're in the book, right? How, <laughs> how do we fare? Was that? Well, you said that you've practiced having a lower center of gravity. Uh, you got oh, yeah. you got bullied a lot. You were in survival mode. Yeah. Um, Lord of the Flies. Uh, it's kill or be killed was a mentality through this a lot. How would you realistically fare in that second challenge? Oh, the pa the passage. Yeah. Is that the second challenge? Well, uh, the, in the, pa the first one is you got to kill the person in the room. Oh, that first passage. So, what's the second pass? What's the second challenge in your mind? The, the second challenge is the full-on castle. Um, oh no, I, I think I'd, I think uh, I think I'd excel in that because I'd be excited to finally be in that situation. What would you do? The, would you scout? Would you hunt together? Would you? I'd probably be like Severo. I would uh, peace out. Let the house because it's it's always when they're deciding the, the regime that people get killed. So if you look at any purge throughout history, whenever the government is shifting, that's when people die. Um, yes. it's, you know, it's, it's basically consolidation of power means a lot of people get, you know, killed in the middle of the night. Um, and so you I, have if to I was be on Severo, the right side. Yeah. Yes. If I was Severo, or well, you have to be on the right side or you are, you get yourself out of the situation and then, then, then assess. So I'd be like with all these power hungry people who are like, you know, way more powerfully built than I am and better bred and trained, I get the hell out. And then I'd like, you know, peep through the window, um, and see when like I could come in back in and add value. Okay. That's what I'd do. That's, that's the best be, survival tactic. You wouldn't be you. You would be a gold. So what does gold pierce look like? I don't know. I don't know. It depends. But the, there's a problem is a lot of it doesn't depend on you because they're young in the book. So they're more so a product of their parents and their lineage. And so it would be decided based unfairly on my lineage and my you know personal pedigree. So then that's one of the fundamental unfairnesses of the book uh, and, in, and in our society. You're not a product of your efforts. You're not a product of, um, you know, what you choose to live for. You're very much shaped and angled like a spear by your parents and then thrust into the, what do they call that in Rome? They call it in Rome the cursus honorum. Cursus honorum is the stages that one has to ascend within political appointments in order to get the next uh, the next appointment. Mm. And so the goal there was always to be a consul. Not to be a consul, actually. The consul was the guy, basically, there were two of them. They ran Rome. They had like a year-long, often a year-long or sometimes two-year-long reign. They ran Rome. But after they were consuls, they got appointed to be a military governor somewhere, and that's what everyone wanted. So the consul, the top position, was not even the end of the cursus honorum. You wanted to go off. Uh, be the magistrate of Macedonia or Spain or Illyria, and then basically extract wealth, hopefully conquer a few territories, sell, well, wealth in their time, particularly if Rome was slaves. Like Caesar, when he took Gaul, he took back two million people into slavery in Rome. And two million people made him a trillionaire in his day and time. So these people, these, these figures, and what I love in the gold world is these figures had disproportionate power, a uh, power so disproportionate to our even understanding of it. They had personal armies, so it'd be like wow. if you know, it'd be like if Elon Musk. We think of him as rich, you know, compared to Caesar coming back with two million slaves. He, he's not rich because Caesar had an army about a hundred, hundred thousand people, hundred fifty thousand people. Imagine like an Elon Musk with one hundred fifty thousand, or proportionately, so like a million man army. Well, like, they how, call how Twitter blue scarier. subscribers. <laughs> yeah, tw <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. But instead of, you know, getting paid by his subscribers 84 bucks or whatever it is a year, all those guys will die and kill for Caesar. Wow. You know, and so that's that's why I like playing with history and then putting that in Red Rising. So all these people are competing to be able to be a guy or a gal who can have a million man army and really have influence. So all these people when they finally at the curse end of the curses on Orum would come back home uh, with tons of wealth, then they would retire or try to affect Roman politics. And so Anyways, I'm rambling. How long could you talk question? about this for realistically? What's that? How long could you talk about this and not come up for air? Oh, I could filibuster all day, literally. Wow. I, it's, it's a huge passion. Like I, I think often uh, science fiction or fantasy books uh, will wear the clothing of ancient Rome or Greece, but they're not actually like the authors seldom like love it. Like I just, I just love yeah. the history of the time period. It's really fascinating to me. It's particularly interesting because we live in a world where uh, people are so separate from their power. They can sit behind a desk in Washington or wherever and send other people to die. Mm -hmm. um, but in Rome and in Greece, you had to go put yourself on the front lines. 
And I feel as though that bred a very different type of creature yeah. and a very different type of exploration of themes than we have. We can't say a president is brave. We can't say that a senator uh, showed honor, you know, not in the same way. The metal wasn't tested. That's why the Institute, the Institute is meant to strip away all the things that separate you from the themes that I want to play with. What would you be like when you had to stare your decisions in the face and create out of nothing civilization? Because they track, you know, in, in Red Rising, the Institute is basically, it's meant to mimic the three, the three stages of society, which are any society, which is savagery, uh, ascendance, and then decadence. And so these people are going through, you know, like a little sim city of what, uh, uh, like you ever play Civilization the game or Rome Total War or any of these 4X games. I loved those growing up. And um, the real-time strategy games, but also when you'd be on, you know, a battle map, like a, a map and have to have your economy and stuff. They're basically going through the progressions of civilization. And so that's the lesson that's t taught to these golds. And so, like, when I discovered this kind of, like, concept for Red Rising, I was so excited to finally get to talk about all these things. But with spaceships, with gravity yeah. boots, with all these far, you know, ridiculous ideas. Um, I don't want to get into spoiler ter territory. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite from the first book? uh favorite thing that you crafted that you created what someone called in mord we trust has just followed um can we just oh. not start the cult right now <laughs> uh, what's my favorite thing i crafted so there, you were uh, talking about gravity boots you were talking about the, the, like the different weaponry the different i would say yeah i would say carvers um because when I started thinking about uh, technology, and a lot of times in science fiction, like Star Wars decided to be World War II in space, um, and that's a way that the technology doesn't run away from the character interactions. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was attaching the technology to the overall theme of the Golds, which is humanism. How can we make an individual human um, uh, be able to project their power in a physical and metaphorical way? And so they, they do it with their arm, suits of armor and their spaceships, and they're all, it's all about projecting internal power. And so they don't have like AI or robots involved because that goes against their kind of thematic, like their religion really, which is the exalting the human, right? And so I would say that it would be carvers because uh, the ability to craft griffins and dragons and uh, designer monsters and put wings on people, um, it really kind of made this world, I thought, unique because you see these people that have unlimited technology diving into fantasy and being like we want to keep fantasy alive yeah so some of these golds are so rich they have an entire continent that's just a game preserve you know and in many ways the evil tyrants you know are pr way better with nature and with preserving uh wildlife than you know others would be so like they're very fascist and evil yet they some of them would like have a whole game per, uh, like a preserve for natural wildlife and you know bring back uh, uh species that had been extinct so i'd say carvers are really fun to play with because they uh entertain that part of me that if i was a you know if i was a billionaire i'd spend all my money trying to convince people that the loch ness monster is real you really or trying think so? to convince i i think so i think i don't i wouldn't need that much i wouldn't buy twitter you know, um, <laughs> what if you bought Twitter and then made so many bad decisions that it was worth half the right. value in a few? How about this? Okay. I would have a fund. I wouldn't say all my money, but I would have a fund mm -hmm. dedicated to making people think magic was real. You know, and like <gasps> who and so says really, magic's not? Well, yeah, I'm not saying this. But I'm saying what people think. You know, it's a commonly held. We saw a magic, magic show. That was some, fucking some, magic. We did, but some people think magic may not be real. But how fun would it be to be like, you know? show evidence of Bigfoot and like plant, uh, plant fossils in places. And then all the scientists over the world would be scratching their heads trying to solve so it. So you would spend so your exorbitant amount of money just to fuck with people. I would, I would, I would basically uh, consider it a community service, yes. I'm a button pusher by nature. You might mm. have noticed this. And so it would be really fun to sit back. Like that would be my, I wouldn't be evil in any way, but I would like to have a joke on humanity. And that would be, it'd be like my Ozymandias moment. Like, ha, 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 Bigfoot is not real. All that new evidence I planted, you know, that'd be great. I worry about Bored Pierce. Yeah. I yeah. would not like to meet Bored Pierce. Well, Bored Pierce ended up writing books, so. No. Hey, well, no, that's not 
bored. Boredom piece. is where create boredom is where creativity creativity comes from. It's why it's so hard to create in our serotonin ecosystem now. You know, like little gerbils being like, you know. Jade in the comments has asked what your um, alignment is. Do you play Dungeons and Dragons? I'm chaotic neutral. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> Jade, you called it. Jade said chaotic neutral, and you're oh, like, oh yeah. yeah, I am so chaotic neutral. It hurts. Hold yeah. on, I think. What does my community say that I am? I think I am too. Are you? I think I. I, I feel. I feel like you're good. I feel you, like you're fundamentally good. I would. Say, I would honestly say lawful good. They're saying chaotic good. No, I, like chaotic little, good? I like a little chaos. I'm yeah, a bit. Maybe I have. Maybe I haven't appreciated your chaos yet. Really. Everyone, yeah, they're all saying chaotic good. <laughs> mm. Mm. Uh, well, that laugh may be. Yes. Yeah, they're all saying chaotic good. Fantastic. Oh, well, at least good. I'm doing something good. At least I'm doing something good, though. 100%. Um, you're just yeah. neutral. Like, you could be bought and sold. Well, no. That would then be, I, I think that would go against my chaos element. Because then that would imply ownership, bought and sold. So I think part of my chaotic, it would necessitate me not the being bought and sold. Okay. Yeah, so independence would be everything probably to my to my alignment. Okay, hold on. Have you played D and D? Hmm. Have you played D and D? Oh, way back when, yeah. But I haven't played in years. I, I played uh, growing up all the D and D uh, games and obs obsessed with uh, the world. And but yeah, out here be honest it's like you just run out of room for hobbies and what i don't know it's hard finding a great crew you know well <laughs> i'm playing right now i also did three seasons of an improvised D, &D, &D show called fungeons and flagons that was oh. that was a lot of fun maybe Drinking that's where I... yeah. yeah yeah well invite me next time i'll play okay good uh, I've got a bunch of questions here um, and I've got to start getting into fan questions. If you're a book club member, Mods Book Club member, then you get to submit questions and I will read them out. Uh, yay, STS says F and F hype. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, Shinagog, I will get to that question. I am going to ask it very soon. Um, <laughs> There's a plan. Alexa says I've experienced Mods chaos. <laughs> Just because I kicked her. <laughs> I was in the yeah. character. Actually, you and I together, that's how, our, that's how we end up when we're not drinking, feeling more drunk than when we are. True. That's you've seen that. Very true. Yeah, I you've have. seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's the chaos, right? Yeah, I definitely had a hangover from that. We didn't drink. We didn't drink, well, everyone. We didn't drink. We didn't, we didn't drink, drink. But, we, but we felt drunk. And then we went to get burgers and ate a terrible, terrible amount of food. And then that's went through the drive through again. again to get more yeah. sauce, but we'd already eaten all the food. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah. X Men. You're obsessed with X Men as a kid. Who's your favorite X Men character? Me? Yeah. You you said you loved X Men as a kid. Yeah. I do. Is oh, that I your do. Number I do. One? I do. Oh, yeah. I, uh, yeah. Comic number one. Comic uh, number one. Comic probably. Yeah, I'd say, and it's really hard to go away from Wolverine. Mm, is he your boy? Wolverine. I love Wolverine. Yeah. Uh, I I like the others, but Wolverine. And I always got so annoyed by Scott Summers because he always gave Wolverine a hard time. And I, you know. yeah, because Wolverine was trying to steal his chick yeah that's what wolverines do what water is wet you're gonna be mad at it if if i didn't like wet water yeah well glaive scott alone dude's got you a shit like that. Well, he's just like got, that. i mean can you imagine waking up every day and be like whoa sorry uh, there's a yeah, hole you, you, in the ceiling you love the long the long I'm just good boy. i'm uh -huh. i have empathy actually it'd be wolverine or professor x I think Professor X has way too much. You have to have – it weighs on your conscience. You're basically like a – Oh, yeah, I feel for him. Unpaid therapist. Yeah, but, <laughs> Just but what a – everyone's stuff. But what a wonderful man, you know? What a wonderful man to take his own trauma and, uh, you know, create a safe place for others. I'm just trying to think if I've interviewed Pat Stu. I mean, I, there's no better casting for that probably in any movie. Him and – I mean, him and Ian McClellan, like – couldn't you could I can't even imagine better casting. Yeah, but that's OG X Men. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Do you like um the newer, like the first class casting? Wait, I'm going so off topic. I it's will right. ask that. Yeah, it's good. I mean I mean, yeah, Fastbender's wonderful. Um on screen. Um <laughs> Have you met him? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Um, Is he a different uh, life? Never mind, never mind. Oh, okay. I, I, I can only attest to him on screen. Yeah, I don't, yeah. yeah. 
I don't speak to things I don't know. Right. Well, I, no shade, I mean, no I meet a lot young. of people and I've met some bad, like, you know, they say don't meet your idols. Some of them have been amazing. Ian McKellen, we love. We love, we love him. If you, anyone's going to have a cup of tea while I interview them, happy place. Some yeah. of them, I'll tell you off camera who the, <laughs> the worst ones have been. Um, speaking of casting, though, and good casting, have you thought about new generation people or has there been a person who's been in a movie or a show and you're like, oh, my God, that's Darrow. Oh, there's Mustang. Um, Pax, hello. Not particularly. Oh. You know, uh, I don't really fan cast in my head. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's also a, it's a moving uh, figure because uh, by the time this thing finally gets made, you know, the, the original ideas, they're already like, you know, 30, they're 35, you know? Yeah. So, um, not really. Um, I'm asked that, asked that question a lot, but no. Who do you no, see I, yourself as most? Me? Yeah. Oh, God. Um, I don't really do that. Like, I don't. Um, you wrote them. I don't project. Yeah. But how much, yeah. what percentage of yourself are in some of these characters? You're like, where is that? Well, you know, probably in terms of um, projection, it's usually going to be your protagonist. Yeah. Um, Murakami had a wonderful thing that he said about protagonists. It's kind of like um, you were a twin and uh, two identical twin with someone, with a brother, and uh, they were stolen away when you were two years old and raised uh, in a completely different country, um, learning a completely different language. Um, and that's how your protagonists are. They come from you, you know, starting off in the same way. And then you see it through the lens of whatever world they exist in. So I'd say Darrow's probably the closest. Uh, he's like a long lost brother who got separated when I was young and then grew up in a different direction. What do you love about um, Darrow and what do you not like about Darrow? Oh, there's a lot of things I don't like. Um, his stubbornness, um, his hubris. Um, but Darrow's a character that continues to grow, you know. Um, sometimes I get flack for Darrow using... A particular parlance or talking about um you know having uh internal biases and like he's a 16 year old minor yeah. who's never seen this guy but he's already you been know, he's, but he's already been married he's already been married so he's advanced in some ways and behind in other ways mm. i have a, i have trouble often in a far-flung world when the character the protagonist or character has all of our cultural mores and has it has to be as progressive as we are as a society um, I think that like the characters should come from a position um, or what makes sense in their society, you know, and have been raised according to the rules of that society, and then you can show growth. So a lot, I think that Darrow's hubris and his pride as a hell diver is something that I find even sometimes annoying. Okay, and, 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 but well, necessary. And necessary, but also like you know, that's uh, this gotta be a cocky son of a bitch, and then humbled. And I think that that pride is an interesting thing to play with with the protagonist. So I'd say his pride, um, perhaps also his uh, inability to listen to others, um, probably reflections of my younger self. Mm. Um, yeah, so I'd say those are things I don't like. Things I like about him are his also his virtues. It's very Greek, his unwavering stubbornness. You know, his uh, going to get the job done. And his uh, lack of quibbling when a, moral, when a morally gray decision or a morally bankrupt decision needs to be made to attain his goal. Um, I think is one of my favorite things about him as a protagonist. For instance, uh, Darrow came about as a character because I was irritated by the Hollywood type protagonist who has to uh, be morally clean at the end of a, of a story. Say, for instance, they've beaten the, the enemy and the enemy's laying on the ground, the villain. And then they say, I'll spare you or whatever. And they show they're good. And then they turn their back or whatever, and then the enemy lunges up with a spear to stab them, and then they have to kill the enemy, or a friend shoots the enemy. Because what that does is it teaches the audience that they can get the catharsis they want by having the enemy killed, but have no repercussions No for blood it. on their hands. But I wanted Darrow to be like, let's bathe this guy in blood and see if his, his thesis still stands, and let's see how his heart you know, can war against itself, because I think that's fundamental for having an interesting protagonist, someone who's a fundamentally at war with themselves. Um, and their exterior actions don't match their interior um, all the time. Because the beauty of a story is then when they're doing things where their exterior actions don't match their interior and you feel the tension, and then at the end they express their interior world on the exterior world, and that's a full culmination moment and you should, should usually happen at the apex part of a story, at the, um, you know, ideally in a climax. And that's why some climaxes feel really satisfying in movies. 
when the interior world is finally being expressed right. because there is no more tension and all it is for the audience is catharsis. You thought a lot about this, huh? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Got to do something with my time. Um, more questions. One of the ones I really want to get to with this is what was it like? So you technically wrote Red Rising in six weeks and then it needed to be yeah. edited and you push it out there. And like, you know, apparently yeah. you took it to 120, you got rejected 120 times before you found a publisher that'll publish it. Yeah, I got, uh, so six weeks to about like three months. It's kind of vague because you enter into a fugue state when you're doing it. But I'd say the rough draft was, it was a very, very rough draft done in six weeks. Yeah. And I'd say I had a more, more formalized one in three. And then I, uh, got, I, I wasn't able to even attain an agent. Um, because you have to submit books to uh, agents because publishers won't read um, they won't read your stuff because of lawsuit uh, yeah. cap possibilities. Uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd queried over 120 agents and been rejected. And then finally, and I queried uh, 28 times for Red Rising and no one wanted it. I had yeah. some interest, but I uh, was still kind of getting jerked around. And then finally, an agent uh, pop came up came up out of the got it emailed me, and she had uh, been the assistant on an agent who had rejected me f six times. And she said, I'm starting my own desk or her own client list, uh, and I'd love for you to be my first client. And she was 23 as well. Wow. And, and, um, but when she spoke of the book and she was just so passionate, uh, I needed to go with, you know, I had to go with her. And then, then we started shopping it to uh, publishers. And there was interest in actually uh, a publisher wanted to buy it, but they wanted to cut out the first 100 pages and just start with there at the Institute. Oh, interesting. And so I faced my first, uh, my first test, my passage. And I said that they were wrong and asked, you know, would they, would they back off that? And they said they wouldn't. They would only buy it if I agreed to do that. And weirdly, like, I have no idea where I came. I have, like, when you look back at things, you, like decisions you made, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm astounded that I had the gall to say no. I said no. And then two weeks later, I received a three-book offer for five times the money with Random wow. House, who didn't want me to change a thing. Wow. And right. that then ended up the guy who bought the book there ended up leaving the company five weeks later, which is called being orphaned. And usually when you're orphaned, you lose your champion and your book can like die off. Then uh, I got given to another editor, a man named Mike Braff, who is now my best human friend on this planet. He's a good and, <laughs> and he was a uh, comparable in age and, you know, he's my Samwise, you know, yeah. he's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's, he's my Samwise. Like he's one of my favorite people on this planet and the books wouldn't be the books without his influence on them. And so it's a weird, weird path to it. But uh, some people think it's, you know, it can seem like an overnight success or whatever because yeah, I was young and I did it. But, yeah. You know, but it's always a slog, you know. Um, but when it was published, you were a New York Times bestseller and you instantly mm. got the rights for a movie. What was yeah. that like going from so much rejection to the top of your game? And then thinking that that was going to do that, and then the well, movie didn't get made, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all it is, you know, until you're a certain point, all it is is entering into a new, like, it's like, you play Elden Ring? Yes. Yeah, it's like kicking ass and being like, God, my guy is, my character is amazing. And you just, you know, you finally beat the boss and you get, you know, the best sword. And then you, the next boss you face, you just get completely annihilated yeah. by. And you're just like, yeah, humbled. I was so that's an astronomer. Was like. They were very good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I play yeah. the uh, I play a guts build, uh, quality guts build strength decks. Oh, uh, is that right? Build. Yeah. Well, I I love the I love the an, um the anime guts or anime manga, uh, uh berserk, and uh, so I uh, yeah I do the great sword yeah guts build. Cool. But anyway, uh, <laughs> um, it's very it's very humbling because you think here I've arrived and yeah, then you yeah. just get like stepped on by the foot of a giant. And, you know, I showed up to Hollywood. It was in a bidding war between Sony and Universal. I was so excited, thought it was going to be made, and then uh, stuck in development hell. You know, uh, not the most fun experience. But then, uh, fortunately, they finally had uh, several iterations of the script. I wrote the first, like, I don't know, 13 drafts or something. Wow. And then finally they hired, a, they hired another writer, and he wrote, you know, a pretty abysmal draft. And when I was reading it, I was thanking, I was thanking God or, you know, Athena, rather, yeah. uh, thanking Athena um, that uh, it was so bad because then I was like, there's no way they can make this. And true to form, uh, or true enough, they didn't make it. And I got the rights back, so I held on to the rights for a long time because I was like, I don't want to get squashed again because they were just changing so many things. They, you know, they were trying to make a love love triangle between, um, the, how would I say it? They wanted to, one of the ideas that was floated was making Severo a girl. 
and uh, having a love triangle between him and Mustang and Darrow. And I'm like, guys. Oh, okay. The, 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 I already did my love triangle. The love triangle was meant to be EO and Mustang. And yeah. I kill one of the corners. So then Darrow is actually dealing with interesting things. Not who do I pick, but more mm -hmm. so how do I honor someone I truly love? No, is it betrayal of my people? That's far more interesting. Team werewolf or team vampire piece. Oh, God damn oh, it. <laughs> I know. I know. And sometimes, you know, you get these notes and you're just like, run, run for the hills. <laughs> I'll just write for my dog. Also, I just don't think Red Rising should be a movie. I think it'd be better as a TV series. Yeah, that's the general idea now. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's in it's in uh, development with a streamer. Unfortunately, I'm rather, uh, what did I say? How did they say it? My golden handcuffs are, or a golden oh. muzzle, rather. So I can't say who it's being adapted by. But um, it's been uh, in development for quite a while. And I think it'll get made. Um, we'll know probably this year whether or not it will. It's okay. really dependent upon the script being in a place where they feel like throwing money at, at the at the. At the it thing. needs a budget. It needs a budget. Yeah. I should have just written a romantic comedy. Next time, huh? Yeah, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> Love doesn't have to prevail. Where were you to tell me to be more practical when I was 22? Um, I was hosting Nickelodeon Australia. Oh, were you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So soz just have you been have you been good or uh, what is it oozed what do they call it slimed slimed yes a have lot. you been slimed you've been slimed I don't want to ah about it. trauma let's go into your trauma <laughs> it's still in my ear Alexa um, uh, if you're still listening <laughs> bookmark this for mod trauma talk later <laughs> all right we need fast answers Pierce I know you love to chat but I want really quick answers I'm a, I'm a chatterbox all right um, these are fan questions so contained let's go. Uh, Clever Girl wants to know, are you inspired by current events? Seldom. Oh, uh, KP Dubs uh, asked actually earlier saying, because of my age, I would be of an appropriate age to be in the show, um, being 16, 17. Who could oh, I sure. play? Um, Antonia. <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> And uh, in reference to the uh, the earlier question, uh, seldom in, <laughs> seldom interested in, seldom interested in current events, uh, mostly because I feel like you know we all have our opinions, and that's not really what I'm interested in. What I like dealing with are like kind of fun. I'm more interested in fundamental human truths, so like things that happen in political systems, populists that come up, uh, things like that. Hold on, I just got to yell at my chat for agreeing with you for the casting. Oh, they um, like that. Mm. They agree. Mm hmm. Oh, perfect. Uh, KP Dubs also wants to know, uh, with Mars being the closest planet to Earth and one that has at least some water on it, is it the most realistic place for humans to colonize? And oh, so a lot of fiction is set mm. there. Do you find it challenging to come up with a unique take on a Mars story? Were there other Mars based works that you drew inspiration from? No, because I, I kind of leap past most of the other, the other stories. Um, th they're usually more about colonizing Mars. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of about 800 years past that. Yeah. And so, no, not really. I, I'd say also, you know, uh, John Carter Mars, which, you know, I, I really I read enjoyed. that. You did? Yeah, you read that? I read yeah. it. Yeah. Hell did. yeah. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the next book, well, there's references to it. There's Easter eggs. Ooh. Um, I really enjoy it, but you know, that's dealing with Mars having like a really ancient past. Uh, honestly, no one, I don't think, I mean, maybe someone has, but I don't think that I've read or seen anyone do the treatment of Mars that I've done. Um, no, and, no, no, not in the right, forecasting. And, yeah. So, and as for the most likely, uh, you know, it, it all depends on fuel. You know, if we can f solve the fuel problem, it's probably because it's closest. Now, in regards to terraforming and stuff like that, Titan is probably more likely, or even Venus, if we can find some way to reduce Quick the uh, greenhouse gas. Sorry, it's a science question. Yeah, I know. Uh, or Venus, if we can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by crashing meteors into it and having a never never mind i'll stop Thank but you. It, maybe there's others yes science this is like the science my chat loves we've there's got so many like spheres civil to engineers. talk about we've yeah got, and if you, you could know. live on io you could have unlimited technology because the title uh the title forces that work on the planet uh the moon Peace Tree says, I asked my US friends to ask this at signings, but maybe it'll hit a little differently coming from Maud. When are you coming down to Australia so I can get Red Rising signed and also offer you the Aussie bucket or box? That's a reference to the Oh, leaderboard. that sounds, that sounds, uh, I feel like the Aussie bucket or box would probably be the most intimidating of all the boxes. 
or buckets. Uh, yeah, it's a howler initiation thing. Um, God, yeah, with wildlife you guys have, I don't know about the bucket or box invitation, but I'd love to get down to Australia. Um, I'll figure out a way to 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 do it. Uh, no promises on timing, but I'd love to do it like at the end of the end of this year, top of next. Oh yeah, yeah, it's but really I'd like to finish. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've never been, and um, my you know, mod. Now that I know a local, you, you have know. a you have a couple of Australian friends, don't you? Yeah, I do have a couple. Yeah, yeah. It's only one. I'd uh, love Va to get down there though. Hmm. Oh, Vaden says there is a ton of references about ancient Greeks and Romans in Red Rising. Is there one people or person? Uh, that is there one? Oh, is there one out of the Greek uh, and Romans? Is there one that people rarely talk about or never talk about that you would like to highlight quickly? Oh, lovely question. Yeah, uh, Alcibiades, who was a general during or a general of Athens. Al Alcibiades. Alcibiades. Yeah, A L C I. No, that's all good. Yeah, A L C I B I A D E S. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, he was a extremely, extremely capable young man in general who was, I think it was a student of uh, Socrates. Yeah, I think he was a student of Socrates. Was it Socrates? Yeah, it was Socrates. Okay. And um, anyway, he was he was the most. He was incredibly handsome, incredibly gregarious, incredibly talented at everything he did. Uh, but he was so damn proud and cocky Aww. and slept with everyone's wives Ooh. and got alienated and so he had this failed mission to Syracuse where Athens lost a lot of people and anyway he got chased out of Athens and then got chased then he ended up allying with the Spartans who were then at war with Athens then he got chased out of Sparta then he went to the Persians then he got chased out of Persia so and then he went really back to Athens guy. he's but he was so talented and it oh, would be so like, I, I really think he's but he's also such an asshole and he has no like loyalty or he honor. sounds like a gold yeah, he's a very fascinating character. Uh, him and the Spartan general Lysander, um, who was a general during the Peloponnesian War and fought against the Athenians, which um, he was very interesting in his tactics. And he was very non-Spartan. He was very uh, cunning, and the Spartans weren't always accused of being such. Hmm. Would you rather have talent or be likable? In the Red Rising world? In general. Um, that's hard. <laughs> likable. Okay. Because uh, because in the end, it's about tribe and community. True and belonging. I get you. Yeah. And connection. Um, yeah. There's a lot of uh, a question on how to lead others comes up a great deal in Red Rising. Oh, Darrow yeah. learning from many sources. Have you been a leader for a group? And if so, what's your style to lead? This is a Vaden question. Uh, yeah, I'd say. But whenever I found myself in a leader leadership position, it was not one I sought. I've never really been attracted to like trying to seek leadership. It would just be more like ad hoc situations. I would say, have a plan, do it, and respect people's opinions. And if I mean, <laughs> if you're leading, you know, if they don't respect your opinion. Often be these like very ad hoc situations. I would just go do it anyway. Mm. Um, and so the, it's not about trying to control people. It's about trying to inspire people. And people feel inspired when they feel listened to, uh, connected to, and feel like they have stake in the game. And mm -hmm. so I'd say that fundamentally, the most important thing is respect. Um, so even if you're listening to someone, you're, how would you say it? You can hear someone, but you don't have to listen to them, if that makes sense. Vaden says, just like Mustang. Hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's, you know, Darrow, I mean, Darrow's a cat that gets betrayed because he alienates. Um, and his style of leadership has it, it changes over the course of time. But uh, when he's young, he alienates because he fails to understand human management. And I'd say, you know, Mustang is far better at managing because she fundamentally, you know, isn't coming from a place of, of uh, rage like Darrow is. You know, Darrow is annoyed when someone's in his path because they don't know the true stakes. Also, how could anyone, ever, like, especially early on in, in Red Rising, how could they understand, uh, how could they understand the pathos behind him because he's secretly a Red whose wife was killed, yeah. you know? Um, so for him, there's a reason there's going to be that kind of friction with the people he's leading, whereas Virginia is coming from a place where um, she doesn't have that hidden agenda to the same degree. And Antonia is just manipulative. Mm -hmm. But there's those cats, you know. What books do you recommend? So many. Um, oh, so I read one of the books that you recommended me. Which Remember one? how we were like, I was like, what book? And you were like, you... You're the only person that really had a book for me. So I was like, done. Uh -huh. And I, I oh, read Man it. Oh, Man Search for Meaning? Yeah. Which one was it? Yeah, Man Search yeah. for Meaning. Yeah, I wanted Victor to give you one Frankel. of those. 
Yeah, I wanted to give you one that was slim that punched because, oh, you know. punched? Are you kidding? So I listened to this over Christmas. Yeah. And the first half of this book, it just destroys you because Victor Victor Frankel, he's a psychiatrist who was in World War II. In fact, I think I, I recommended it to a few people. Um, and didn't you read it, Vaden, maybe? Um, but it is just explores the worst part of humanity and what people mm -hmm. are willing to do to another person person because of war um, and he survived it and then he kind of had this breakthrough um, psychiatry sort of a, a dimension what he what, what he went well, into yeah, which was like yeah. finding the purpose to life because you if you, but, as long as you have yeah. purpose then you have a will to live mm -hmm. and he went in as a psychiatrist so he was already seeing it through that lens mm. which is particularly unique to his holocaust story it wasn't it Seeing it and, and being able to have that macro view while suffering was incredible, wasn't it? One of and the lines was just, just like, as soon as someone lost hope or lost their purpose, they would last maybe two or three more days before they would die. Yep. And you just had to hold and, on to it. And one of the biggest things that even if you have absolutely nothing, you're starving, people are dying all around you, it's still your decision to have that purpose and to have positivity mm -hmm. and that people mm -hmm. still found it in concentration camps. Very rare, mm -hmm. but it could happen. Oh, it was amazing. Great book. Uh, I'd say that that's one of the book I recommend everyone. It's a short read. Uh, Lord of the Flies is one I always recommend people because a lot of people read it in school. Yeah. But, uh, you know, school, you don't really realize how great some books are. No, because you have to uh, read it. You don't want to read it. Yeah. Yeah. Mists of, Av Mists of Avalon is another one. What's that? Um, it's about the women surrounding King Arthur. It's oh. a fantasy, yeah, uh, written by a woman about the women in King Arthur's, uh, how would I say it, orbit, but are really the forces at work upon his entire legend. Mm -hmm. a brilliant book. Um, my sister actually turned me on to that when I was younger. Oh, that's cool. Some crossover. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's exceptional. Um, I'd also say uh, another good one is um if you really like uh, like a historical fiction um gates of fire by stephen pressfield um it's about the the best book about the battle of thermopylae um yeah i mean i can, I can just go on forever are you gonna write fantasy mm -hmm. yeah yeah after red rising is done i have one more i believe in uh i need to finish the thing right um, before you can start another I, thing yeah i need to finish the thing. you've got an idea brewing Oh yeah, I've had I have so many. I have, I have I have one high fantasy. I've kind of got a uh, another one that's I, I what would you call it? mid or low fantasy? I don't know. Um, yeah, a bunch of ideas All right. that I'm desperate that I've had for like eight years that I just you know. Are you gonna do standalone no, no or are you gonna dive into another series? Mm, be hard just to, to dive into another series because a series really is like a marriage, you know. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't be eager to get into another like eleven year engagement. Um, but I think I think I'd do a standalone that could work as a book that could work as an entry into a series, uh, if I feel so compelled. Is it just books, or do you want to get into script writing, films, television? Um, it's all about the story. Uh, I don't think about the medium often. I more so think about what story. How how do you tell the story? You know, uh, for instance, like uh, Alexander the Great. Like it, I wouldn't write an Alexander the Great novel because so many have been written. But if I felt like I could crack that TV show, that did would be you, interesting. Did you read the trilogy? Which one? I don't know. It came out 15, 14 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, like Connor Golden's one? or I don't know. I remember there being a trilogy of them and they were like really popular at the time. Oh, I smashed through those. I loved them. Well, there's quite a few. Um, but I, find, I feel like it would be harder to stand uh, apart in that world. Unless you had something very interesting to say, right? Um, and perhaps I, I think that certain certain areas are very cluttered. For instance, I wouldn't write uh, like a story right off the bat, uh, like sci-fi. Um, sci-fi, it would be hard to want to write a big space opera uh, in a world where Star Wars exists right. in script form. Red Rising is more my version is my version of a space opera, but it belongs in books first because it has to have a different starting. Uh, origin of a different starting foundation than Star Wars. You know, Star Wars, when you really look at it, is a very expansive world that started very thin, on, yeah. you know, and then got bigger and bigger and bigger. But you really look at A New Hope, it's a very kind of small, I mean, it's, it's very light on details, you know what I mean? It's a very narrow keyhole window. So in order to compete in this, you know, and to even get a film made or something like that, I knew I'd have to have like that foundation as a book series. Yes. Um, so it all depends. It's so all your depends team the read the book before watching the movie for sure? 
Like uh, it depends which one people say is better. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a full purist. Um, I'd say I, I would say actually read the book most of the time beforehand. I think there are like um, two or three books where the movie was better. Yeah, they usually have David Fincher involved. <laughs> yeah, well, he's brilliant. Yeah, he's brilliant. No, not from the ones I'm suggesting. What's that? The Notebook of the movie was better because Nicholas Sparks. Um, yeah, he's not He's not perhaps the most uh, evocative what, writer. What they did with the movie I thought was really spectacular. Um, yeah. And Princess Bride. The movie's way better than the book. It is. Yeah. It is. Um, it's nice to you have know, that backstory and, and, and they flesh out Inigo and Fezzik more. Mm-hmm. And that, Honestly, that was interesting. Even, but... Yeah, Clockwork Orange too. Uh, I think even Anthony Burgess said he preferred the uh, the movie. Um, oh. But uh, yeah, sometimes sometimes movie is better, you know. Okay. Hey, um, that's time. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. We're going to be pleasure. reading the next couple of books. Um, what What are the words of diving into Golden Sun? How are you How are you going to prepare all of us? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, that's ominous. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> what? Uh, I love, I love, I like Red Rising. I really do. I love Golden Sun. Golden Sun is batshit insane. Um, it's a really fun book. How would I say it? It basically, uh, Red Rising was a keyhole into the gold world, uh, keyhole view, kind of like now we, we were talking about earlier. It. And this one just dunks you in. Okay. Um, and it, 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 I really enjoy Golden Sun. Yeah, I would just say good luck. Okay. It's, it's chaos incarnate. Good luck. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. and uh, if, you, if you like the historical fiction elements that I was talking about, and if you like uh, a lot of that, I mean, history, um, it really starts embracing it more and family dynamics and politics and all that stuff. So sorry for cutting you off. No, no, that's so good. I, I want to get you going because you had a hard out. Um, mm-hmm. Lisa's saying so good. So Lisa's read the whole series and she's coming back I love to you, read Lisa. it with us. Thank you. <laughs> B-Rock Vandal says thanks for being here, Pierce. Uh, Tame Zoo said thank you for this wonderful and very fun interview. Uh, Catch Me Too says thanks, Pierce. Oh, that's really sweet. The whole community is well, great. Thanks. Thank you so, guys for uh, so ready for it. Um, hold on really quickly. Me. Yeah. Yeah, what's up? This book just came out in a, a different audio style. Uh, Name of the Wind? No. So, oh, you can't uh, see it. You can't see the fact that I'm holding Oh, uh, up Red, Red Rising. Rising. Yes. I see. This book it did. just came out it in a did. different audio format. Tell us about that because it came out last week. Yeah, it came out last week and they do a full dra- uh, audio drama. It's They have uh, several dozen cast members, uh, sound effects, um, and they you know had a whole, uh, they say they do the entire book as though it was an audio play. And I think it's really special. If you, if you would enjoy listening to it again or dive into the story again, it can help make the world more real and really flesh out some of the, I mean, it adds a deeper, deeper element, but it can really flesh out some of the uh, human interactions in the book. Are you uh, I found do it for the next ones? We're going to do it for each one, uh, provided that they are uh, popular. Oh. Um, because they, re- they really went balls to the wall in terms of uh, giving a great production. And so I hope people like it. Uh, I hope people uh, acquire it so that we can do all the whole series because I think it would is, is a format that would work better and better as the books progress into deeper themes and uh, become their own little monsters. All right, yeah. so you heard it. You've got to get this one. Get Red Rising in the new full production, audio production. It's going to amplify how that one uh, sounds, even though the, the audio book, the, the one that we heard, he did a good job. He did a great job. Yeah, yeah. he won an award for that, Tim See? Gerard Reynolds. He's rather a, he's rather a um, how would I say it a sacred cow in the uh, in the Red Rising community. Aww. He yeah people really love him and I do too. I thought I was going to narrate the book and then I got his sample because I got to choose from five or six different samples and I read his or listened to his sample and I was like Whoa, holy crap. Um, so I thought he did a lovely job. So See- some people are diehard enthusiasts of him, but I love seeing um, the different interpretations other voice actors bring to the character. You got options. Uh, Tough says, I've read everything out in the series four times, so now I'll have to listen to it. Hope you enjoy it, man. Yay. Um, and pre-order the book. Book number pre-order six. The book. Pre-order yes, the book. Yes, out July 25th. July? July. July 25th, yeah. everyone. July 25th. Lightbringer. July tw- Lightbringer. Show us, the, show us the banner. Do, do. Oh, yeah, I was using this block of the light, but here you go. They had uh, spring because we hadn't fit. Yeah. You've seen you've seen people with um, 
phrases tattooed on them, haven't you? Yeah, like many people. <laughs> What's that like? Uh, bizarre. Um, especially they, they, the weirder one is when they name their kids after a character that I know I've killed in the next book and they haven't gotten to read yet. So I'm just like, you know, here's, um, I don't know, Titiana. And, uh, I'm like, oh, Titiana dies badly. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of Paxes out there. A lot of Darrow's, um, Pax. I met, oh, I met the, the wildest interaction I've ever had period was I was at, uh, I was with a friend up in Big Sur having, um, at a coffee shop, no, uh, ice cream shop. And uh, this guy came over and asked if I was Pierce Brown. He recognized my dog. And, <laughs> um, of course recognized my dog, but not me. Recognized my dog came over and, uh, yeah, I introduced myself and he introduced himself as Severo and I didn't believe him. And he showed, hi, hi puppy. And he showed me his ID. He'd just gotten his name legally changed to Severo. And I thought that was one of the cooler things I've ever seen. And uh, He legally changed his name. name. He legally changed his name to Severo. Severo X. Um, wow. Yeah, and found a new identity in the name and helped, that helped uh, the, their transition. Um, so it was very interesting. But the, the ink on people, uh, sometimes it's amazing. Often it's amazing. Sometimes a little bit ill-advised the placement. But it's pretty cool to see what people identify with. But so I should get colors. Paxel Telemannus on my on my on your throat. Oh yeah, nice idea. I like that a yeah. lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, thank anyway, you again. I really appreciate you, you stopping on by. Uh, we went a little bit over, but I do appreciate that. Oh, it's uh, all good. Also, thank you to all the members, uh, book club members. If you do want to become a member, you'll get access and voice chats to the show. You get to submit questions to authors just like this. Head over to patreon.com slash Maud's Book Club if you do want to get involved. We have a Discord. Stop on by for the Discord because we're going to be doing books two and three in the coming months as well. It's going to be a lot of fun. Pierce, maybe I'll convince you to do this again with me. I would love to. Mm. Leaning black family. Buy me a beer for each time. We're I'll drinking again? We're drinking oh, again. We're drinking again. Well, I didn't... <laughs> I didn't you didn't get the memo? Well, here's your memo. I didn't really drink last time. Oh, well, Remember? next time. Okay. Oh, but I drank for you. Gonna get shit. But... Okay, everyone. Thank you so much. Wow. Bye. Thanks, guys. Chat soon. Enjoy the books. Thanks for reading. Yay. Bye, Maud. Miss you already. Aw.